Thank you very much. Uh, that was Umoja uh, Africa Group. Let's give them another round of applause. I hope that I hope that that, that exuberant performance really uh, kept us awake. I know that um, in these trying times when it's so hot inside and outside, at times nature kicks in and we're falling asleep and so on. Uh, but let me assure you, let me assure you again, the next speaker, let me assure you again, the next speaker you'll hear. We said we are here to reflect. As we celebrate, let's not just celebrate without reflecting on our past. Where are we coming from? And what past or, 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 or history do we want to conserve for the current and future generation? We know that what is important, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about this iconic site and the anniversary that we are reflecting on here is that we need to take something out of this. You know, when kids, when I get home, I know my children will ask me, what did you learn about attending this important initiative and event. They'll be asking me all sorts of questions. Who was that keynote speaker? Who was this and so on? So I want you to be awake. I'm happy that we had this Umoja group to keep us awake so that the next speaker, as we welcome him to uh, come forward, indeed, he will sustain us and nourish our mind. Let's give Ndate uh, Sikhwale a big round of applause as he's coming to the podium. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I want to touch his hand again. I want, can you touch my blood? <laughs> Thank you. From here. Um, I, I, I just want to say to my wife here, um, don't come home today. unless you can match the dance of these ladies here. <laughs> so, so, Natasha, go for training. <laughs> but the ladies are not here. Um, the way I look at their energy, their exuberance, I ask myself, where were they when we were on Robben Island? We could only dream about them. Because when you are far away from, from home, um, you can only dream. But to the gentlemen who have been dancing before us here, I cannot match your energy. There was a time when I could have been like this in my past. But such exuberance and such force, this energy that accompanies the entire group made me think while sitting there. Europeans in Europe, if only you can see Africa for the happiness that we are putting here, then you'll have less wars and the killings that are happening in that part of the world. We have more to offer as Africans in our culture and our heritage than being taken away from here in cages, than being sanctioned, than our leaders being pointed and being treated like children for us to follow this or that. We have more to offer. How happy the world would be if Africans were given a chance just to do this from time to time. Because of that, I would like to make an application to the director of the group to adopt me as a patron so that from time to time we can help them because I'm sure there are certain networks, certain connections which they require. <laughs> so I would like to hold their hand with some of you here and we'll increase the network. Maybe they don't have a bus to go to their next places. We can organize that Uber bus. Um, maybe here or there a child, as the mother is dancing here at school, they, they need some, they're entertaining us, so 
what more can we do as, as an applicant who's a patron, and I hope I'll be joined by a number of you, here and beyond, let us value what we are seeing here, particularly because we are, this time, celebrating our own Heritage Month. So thank you. <laughs> Chairperson of the Council, uh, the CEO, DDG and other DDGs, um, various guests who are here, I'm not naming anybody because I'll make mistakes. But I would like to name the following people who, after I have spoken, are going to join in providing wisdom and light because I may provide heat. Um, so you need wisdom. Professor Nkondo is here. Professor, stand up so they can see you'll be speaking hereafter. <laughs> Honorable Dr. Lita, where are you? She's going to, there she is. She enjoyed. She's from the AU. Pale Sakadi, where are you, Pale? There she is. And Bafana Setole. Boys, where are you? There's Bafana. After I have made a fool of myself here, it is their job to correct, to place things in the appropriate context. I have elected not to write a speech or to make a lecture. Because quite often, a lot of speeches and lectures, you hear there's a lecture about this one, lecture about this one. They have been abused to use the names of those people in order for people to provide and to forward views that are in discord with what is happening in this country. Ali Tulu speech, Mandela speech. We abuse these things. So I thought we should just engage. I will say my piece. You make your own judgment. But then to the families who are here, would want would really want uh, to appreciate the fact that in you there is the DNA of the people who gave us this country. Because the decision they took when they were here, and I'll come to that, was a groundbreaking decision, a game changer where there was no game for us to play. It was a pivotal moment for your family members to come here and to converge here underground and to prepare us for a future which I hope will not play games with as we are in South Africa today. So we welcome those families for honoring us here at Lily's Leaf because it is your home. The last point on this family issue, don't feel bad. We are talking about biological families here, but all of you are family as South Africans to the leadership that had been here. So welcome yourselves as well. We're family, we're family here. Comrade Steve. Bantubonke Biko, the leader of the Black Consciousness Movement, who died like a dog at the hands of apartheid masters. An Afrikaner government, a racist government, they snuffed his life. Some people used to think that Biko himself, and we belong to his organization as students in black consciousness. They thought he's against white people. He was once asked if he could identify or what black people could identify as heroes amongst whites. His answer was a very simple one. Bram Fisher 
who is Bram Fischer, so admired by the leader of the Black Consciousness Philosophy and Movement, what type of temperature was within the body and soul of this person? What human being is this? An Africana in South Africa, during a time when the Africanas had taken this country the other way, to be admired by Steve Biko. Much is made of the speech that Nelson Mandela gave, and you heard him. There comes a time in the life of a nation. I have fought this, I have fought that, against that, and against that. And then, of course, the famous words, an ideal for which I hope to live to its fruition, but also an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Who led Nelson Mandela in court to, made, to make those words, which reverberated the whole world, which virtually positioned Madiba higher than whatever he was before. The advocate, the senior counsel, a Queen's counsel, because he qualified as well abroad. The advocate who was in charge of the defense team, Ed Rivonia, was an African, Bram Fisher. That same Africana had also taken the lead, was in charge of the legal team during the 1956 prison trial, which saw 156 leaders being charged falsely for prison. The leader of that team was an African the ironies of South Africa, in an Africana-dominated country with repression and oppression, discrimination and racism, in an Africana court, a white court, white policemen, you saw them, white prosecutors, white judge, justice, the vet, Yet this side of the accused was an African. Small wonder that Steve Biko understood that Bram Fischer was in a class of his own. Nelson Mandela has the following to say about Bram Fischer. He says, I fought for justice, for liberation, and for human rights in South Africa but I never fought against my people. Bram Fischer fought for justice, for human rights and liberation against his own people. There is no African leader who has ever been humiliated and subjected to the kind of treatment until his death than Bram Fischer. I never came to know him. I came to know his deputy, who was deputizing during that famous prison trial and the Devonia trial. That is none other than Arthur Chaskerson, who years later was appointed by Nelson Mandela, no longer the prisoner, but this time the president, appointed to become the first president of the Constitutional Court, the first court, highest post-liberation in South Africa. He also became the Chief Justice of South Africa. The irony is that these men about whom we are here, who grew from this soil, who have left their DNA here, which is touching base today with the families, these men believed in the ultimate payment of sacrifice. Theirs was for service. 
theirs was for sacrifice. So you who are carrying their DNA very close, know who your family people were. They gave, you know, to say they are all, it's, it's an understanding, they gave everything. Everything. Where today, will do anything for a tender. Anything to steal government money. Anything to swindle our people. As successors of the men who were here, I'll also say, and women, although there was no one amongst them in the dock. But as they stood in the dock, there were women, wives, sweethearts, girlfriends, sisters, mothers, fellow activists who were fighting with them in the trenches. Winnie Mandela's name comes very easily, the wife of the first accused. Albertina Susul, her name comes in, and all of them. Each one of them you will find there were women. Because even before the Rivonia trial, women stood up in South Africa, 20,000 of them, you know what they did. To go and stand up in front of the government of the Afrikaners to say this far and no further. They say, once the women get involved, Koshwa, Kasa Sutubar Mawana, Otswara Tipa, Kabuhali. When the mother of a child sees a knife coming towards the child, she catches the knife on the blade side. She doesn't know how she did it. That's how motherhood works. In that same defense team, there was George Bezos, a Greek survivor from occupied Nazi Europe. He came here as a child of 13. A white person also defending. But little is also known as we make a huge fanfare about Mandela, correctly so, that the prosecutor was a Jew And Arthur Chaskasen was a Jew as well. So you have the irony of South Africa, an Africana standing against other Africanas, and a Jew persecuting and prosecuting blacks standing against other Jews. It was Joel Joffe in the defense team. So it's Bram. It is Arthur Chaskerson. It is Baron G, an Englishman from the liberal world. It is Joel Joffe. And there's another one. I'm sure there were five. Of course, George Bezos. In an all white court. Nelson Mandela was once asked during his lifetime. What is the single most important thing that we South Africans should take away from the struggle that we have led for so long and so hard? What is it that makes and that should hold South Africans together? We speak about a united, a democratic, non-racial, prosperous, non-sexy South Africa amongst all those qualities. They said to Mandela, which one do you identify as the single most important one? Mandela replied, non-racialism. What makes us a nation in South Africa, and I'll say to Natasha right now, this is the South Africa I know. These days when you go to ANC meetings, the Youth League, you hardly see our people. What makes us a nation are the colors that you see here. Take the colors away, South Africa is not going to remain the same. Yes, we must be united, but on the basis of the fact that we are not uniting as tribes. That's gone before 1912. We are not uniting on the basis of friendship or bruscap uniting on the basis of the fact that that unity, a united South Africa, 
was fighting against the divided South Africa because that's what apartheid was doing, apart-hate hate division a system of dividing people. The victory that was achieved from here, by the leadership as assembled here, was a victory essentially against what the white government, since the British and others, tried to do to divide, divide the people of this country on the basis of their race. That is why another dangerous thing is to divide black people themselves on the basis of their languages and their backgrounds. In 1912, when the ANC was formed, there was a song, it's Mzulu Mkosa Msutu Sanganan. Only when these tribes came together could you stand up to begin to build a new nation. But the unity of blacks alone, on the basis of negating their tribes, is insufficient in a country like this unless we become another country, unless we unite with everybody. White. Indian, sometimes we say, which is Asian, colored, and black. So you have two types of, or two sets of individuals associated with Rivonia as we celebrate this heritage of 60 years. On the one, si on one side, you have the accused. And on the other side, you have the defense team. Who are these people? What is their tapestry? What is their quality? What made them who they were? Imagine people came here, they were lawyers, they were doctors, they were successful people, but they came to dress up in drab clothes as farm hands. Go out there and see where they were staying behind this house. In the house, secretly, it was owned ostensibly by Goldrich. So they took advantage of the divisions in South Africa and the white comrades, Arthur and Harold Wolpe. Arthur stayed in the house here. He's one of those that got away when the arrests were happening and escaped. These men came to dress up as hobos, as farm hands, people in overalls. See their pictures. Susulu looks. looks Terrible, with a moustache. So is government begging. They lived out there, but would only converge with Goldrich and others later when they cannot be seen. A story is told that the children of Arthur Goldrich, you saw some of them here. Excuse me. A story is told that the little white children looked at some of these blacks, these ones are not like the ones who are working here. These could speak better English than Bumokhari Tsohana here. The children were wondering, what? Because by day they pretended they were working here. And by night, this was the headquarters of the high command of the African National Congress and other organizations, including the Communist Party when they were here to set up condolences, to fight. But the children could see that uh, these ones are speaking better English. They also hug mommy, because they know Goldrich's wife. And daddy is more closer to these ones. Why is he not close to Wumema Makharitsu Anna who are working here? For my sins, when I reached Robben Island, because I'm going to take you forwards and backwards. And there's a chapter in my book, Peter Paul, when you're here. You wrote a book without my permission, when. A fellow Robin Islanders. It's scandalous what you have done. He wrote a book without consulting us, about us on Robin Island. Made journalists to interview us and published it, pretended he's the editor, but using our stories. It's called The Better Side of Life on Robben Island. That's the man, Peter Polongwe. By the way, he carries the distinct dishonor. We carried AKs, Kalashnikovs, grenades. Peter is one of the people, and the only MK 
Hader. He worked for IBM and pretended that he's a computer programmer. But he was bringing weapons from Botswana. And one of the weapons he brought was a surface-to-air missile made in the Soviet Union at the time to shoot down aircrafts. I don't know why you upload, upload a criminal of that nature. But here he is. You can talk with Peter later. Bafana Mathayani, who's sitting there, is one of the discussants, together with Prophet Bopalis, was a fellow co-accused in a trial that followed Rivonia. Ours was called the Pretoria Trial, or Pretoria 12. We were defended by the same people who were defending Rivonia, save for Brownfish. So Arthur Shaskasen and the rest of them were with us. In the Palace of Justice, exactly where Ravonia was, was prosecuted. Charged under the same acts, same laws. Sometimes same police, same cells. And sitting in the same court. But when we were sentenced to Robben Island, when we arrived there, in my book, I, there's a chapter called VIP. That's me. Very important prisoner. You thought it was Mandela. It was me. <laughs> this is because all the accused, each one of them wanted to meet me for different personal reasons. Personal. News from home doesn't seep in through the walls. If you are in jail, there's one thing you want to hear. How's Zinzi doing? And right now, they've lost a child. How's this one doing, the son of Swenso? How's my wife? They want to know these things because no media is reporting these things. Similarly, the reason people visit, they want to see how's my husband, my brother, my uncle, and so on. On reaching Robben Island, I became, and I'm writing this story in a chapter, a very important prisoner. Here are the reasons about these Ravonia men. Before my conviction and before I joined Mkondwe Sizwe, I joined the ANC in Mandela's house and I lived for three years with Winnie Mandela. Madiba knew about this young man who stayed at that house. Wanted more stories, because he'll hear more about Zinzi, Zenani, Winnie. He, was, he wanted to find out if this room is like this. is a double one five, feel like us. He wanted to find out if the gate was there, if the dog was still there. He was dreaming because it's 14 years later. But I was his only connection and wanted to spend time with no prisoners. You don't know prisoners. Bamba. He wanted to spend time, not for a day or two, over years, so that he debriefs you. How's Winnie? Does she wear this dress? Those type of things. Even some personal things. So they were craving for news. For that reason, I was a very important prisoner. Walter Susun. Walter Susulu. I went to university with his daughter, Lindy Susulu, in Swaziland. His son, Zelaki, who's passed on, was a friend. I knew Albertina because she worked at the hospital, non European section, General Hospital in Hillbrook, Johannesburg. Albertina worked with my father. And Walter wanted to meet this young man. I'm about 24, so that I can brief him, particularly once we hear about Lindy. People want these things. Elias Mutsualid, I schooled with his son. Same class. I saw somebody I suspect to be him today that I have not seen for many, many years. He wanted to hear 
about his son because I was at high school in Orlando West, their way they shot the children. Raymond Mlaba, I knew his girlfriend. I had been sent up and down to send messages. And he wanted to hear. I said, girlfriend, he married her, by the way, later in jail. And he wanted to see this Tokyo. Because I've got news. Oh, I felt so important, you know. <laughs> Each one of them wanted to meet me. Andrew Mlangeni. I come from Dube in Soweto. The Dube named after John Langalaba Dube, the first president of the ANC. He was the chairman of the Dube branch and a friend of my father. I eventually grew under him. Selo, I grew under a father. He wanted to see Tokyo because I've got news from home, from his friend, my father, and from Dube. Governor Mbeki, when we were at varsity in Swaziland, I was working, I was 20 years old, but I was working under his son. He's slightly 10 years older than me. His name is Tabo Mbeki. Tabo is always 10 years older than me. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, to mimic this person. He knew that I worked with Tabo in the underground in Swaziland. He knew that I knew Mwelet. I knew Chama, his other son who died in exile. I knew Zanele, because when they got married, Zanele, Tabo's wife, she used to come and she was applying scholarships to us from the international I, I, I feel something in Switzerland. Coven was craving news. So I'm the only one he should talk to. But then I wanted to meet Kathrada. I wanted to meet Kathrada because when we were young, we heard that there was an Indian who was working with these people. I didn't understand because I know Indians in Diagonal Street in Johannesburg. And they give us discounts. My mother loves Indians. Woolworths is a bit expensive, or OK bars at that time. Diagonal streets, these are my mother's friends. I didn't believe that any one of them could be fighting side by side with the men who are here. And I wanted to see my hero, Ahmed Kathrada. Because I heard that amongst these people, there was this Indian. I was not to see Dennis Goldberg. Because apartheid prevented me from being an important prisoner to him, since they don't allow white prisoners on Robben Island. We are all black. The jailers are all white. This particular prisoner, Dennis Goldberg, was kept away from us, kept away from his own friends. But then Dennis was joined two years after Rivonia by Bram Fisher. The Bram Fisher who defended at Rivonia, these leaders was himself a suspect because he used to be here underground with Mandela and others. Eventually, he was caught. Can you imagine the Prince Council's senior counsel who was defending them was here plotting the arms struggle and controversies with them? It made him uncomfortable to represent them because he knew that he is part of this thing. Two years after they were sentenced to life imprisonment because he saved them from the death penalty, he himself was discovered, arrested, charged for conspiracy and sabotage, and himself sentenced to life. He died a miserable death. Two months before his death, he was released. He could not walk. He was a skeletal, the son of a free state advocate an African, he died a miserable death. Because on being released, Bram Fisher was kept. At his brother's house, a house which was turned into a prison for the brother to, to guard him. 
Who are these men? There's Harold Wolpe. There's Lionel Bernstein. There's Bob Helpel. There's Jimmy Cantor. Some got away. Some could not be convicted. And these eight I've referred to ended up on Robin Island. Who are these men? Nowadays, on social media, you hear people, ah, leadership. <laughs> my leader. When I meet people, I my, especially if they want some money, hey, my leader. <laughs> and leadership. They want, they've got a truck. A man has got a truck to, uh, to purchase coal from Pumalanga and go and sell it so that he can buy sharp pointed shoes, a headbag for the wife, um, and a car for show off. Nothing wrong with these things, but we've got to have a sense of purpose. My leader, leadership. <laughs> to many people, that title qualifies. But in my life, with what I have seen, there are all sorts of rascals who are called my leader. <laughs> Tabo Mbeki. Because there's one thing about Tabo. Tabo is not corrupt. We had issues with Tabo, political. But money, corruption, not Tabo Mbeki. That is why he qualifies to say some of these people who are just pure sawdust, who don't equate to the quality of the leadership that emanated from this place. Some of those people who cannot be called leaders. He's got a name for them. Imiko Doi. <laughs> you find them at the levels of branches of organizations, mine included. You find them at mayoral places, they become mayors. You find them as MECs, some of them. They become premiers. I should know as one once a premier. They become ministers. They even creep into the positions of president of this country. Yet, a lot of them are amigo doi. That was correct. <laughs> we, 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 we can't do that, not with the legacy and the heritage of what you are sitting on here, because you are touching right now, touch wood, you're touching the soil of people who germinated this place and gave rise to the Republic of South Africa, as we know it today, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, supposed to be prosperous. There's another name which I want to join Tabo in. The friend of Mkodoi. Mkoho. I don't know if Nia was Mkoho. Peter Paul, I am not saying you're one. You know, there, there's a dog sometimes which you don't know who it belongs to. You hear your dustbin falling and you, you, it has pushed the dustbin. Or it, it, you find it inside there. It's thin in a quick way. It's got scary. I don't know. Uh, its hair is falling. When it sees you, it goes away. But they are friends, these things. My leader, leadership. We call some of these people who are these things by the name which is reserved for the type of people we are honoring and remembering today. What is the source of their inspiration, these people? What is their lodestar, the lodestar of their aspirations? What is the quality of their humanity? What makes these people to be what they are? What is the compass of their strategy? How did they understand where they were going? When things were blind, the organization is banned, they are being arrested. What is the courage of their convictions? We ask these things about ourselves, including myself, Tokyo Sohali. What is the depth of their commitment? How deep were they? Or just little adventitious roots, or they had a taproot? 
what was the strength of their self-criticism? Because I have never seen people more self-critical instead of pointing at others than this Robin Island as I stayed with. Lafana, it was a privilege. We traveled the journey together. We carried guns with you. We were on trial together. Arthur defended us. We were in the death cells due to be hung. And we escaped and we went to Robin Island. But we split. On Robin Island, I was taken to this other section. And that's how I came to experience these people. I'm asking these things because I wonder what makes these people tick. What is the humility of their approach? What are their fears? Fears of their own destiny. Because they were men much as they also had women. They had fears. They were not just brave and courageous. There was no bravado here. They thought strategically, carefully, and with the greatest amount of circumspection before they went for the arms struggle. What kind of readiness did they have to pay the ultimate price? I am prepared to die. It was not a joke, but they were ready to go. It's not a movie. It was not melodramatic. It was a message, and only one. The fact that Madiba lived so many years never to see Brahma again. So many years, and got released and repeated those words in Cape Town. But today, to be betrayed by people who should know better is part of our heritage. Others, like I say, were never caught. Others escaped. Others were exiled. Coming to Mkondwe Sizwe, which led to Rivonia, which we joined later, I would like just to correct something. A serious, serious underestimation of one of the leaders, two of them as though these were some kind of pacifists. No armed struggle could be undertaken after the burning of the ANC here by these leaders without them resorting to the one they respected the most. He was priestly, Oliver Tambo. Sorry, Lutuli. Albert Lutuli. He was the president when the ANC was banned. When they informed Mkontwe Sizwe, he was briefed all along the way. He had a deputy too, Oliver Tambo. Also priestly, who tried to be a priest at St. Peter's here. But his religious studies came to naught because he was given different instructions. After Sharpville, he was given instructions in 1960 to leave the country so that he can set up an international external mission of the ANC to continue the struggle, to explain to the world what is happening here, the banning of the ANC, and why we have decided to resort to using force. Not because we love force, but it is a method of defense. Violence against violence. You touch me, I hit you back. You can't blame me, I'm defending myself. One of the things that was said to me by George Bush, who became president of the United States, when I met him, he was governor of Texas and as a governor or premier of Haute. I later met him in the White House. I was with Matiba. He was president in Tokyo. Why did your people take so long to resort to arms? He said, with us, they touched us once in America in 1776, where? We went for them, and we threw the British out. Remember, America, which today acts as though they were not one. They were a colony, too. We need America to come back to the fold of recognizing that it cannot go and oppress other colonies. It's behaving today like a superpower, as though they were never colonies. But George Bush says, when times were bad, we dealt with the British and the Spanish and the French here. 
1776, otherwise known as the American War of Independence. George Bush wondered loudly to me, he was with Condoleezza Rice in the White House, in the Oval Office, how it took you so long. You were occupied in 1652, 260 years. You formed the ANC, 48 years from 1912 to 1960, when we were banned. He said, with us, we would have fought the following day, because each one is, in terms of the Second Amendment, we carry guns. That's why America fights first and asks questions second. He said, you have taken too long. But he was admiring what we did here, the manner in which the leadership maintained its decorum, its demeanor in the face of grave injustices, provocations, killings, and all these things that you know happened here. Two of these people, the president and deputy, tried to be priests. In fact, the pastor was Lutul. Tambo wanted to study, as I indicated, religious studies. But when the decision had to be taken, they were fully behind it. Distortions are made as though Lutuli did not know. Madiba Kotani Susulu. And the team that was here made sure that he is constantly briefed because he said, you don't get my support until I know that you are doing the right thing. He didn't trust him very much because he knew this Nelson Mandela one. He knew this Mandela one, this Holy Salsa one. He was quick to the draw that one. So they had to manage the whole thing because Madiba is the one who came with the proposal. There comes a time in the life of a people when you are left with two choices, to live forever on your knees or to die standing. We come from that tradition because he gave us that courage. Nelson Mandela had to be very careful in convincing Susulu and others that it is correct to start fighting after what had happened with the banning of the ANC and lastly with the killings that had started. He was arrested, if you remember, coming from briefing the president. When Madiba had been to the whole world, he, went, he would travel to more than 20 countries to ask for military assistance. He had to come and brief the president, but was betrayed along the way. The reports are that, and the man who gave him away confessed he was a CIA agent. He spoke a month before he died. He's an American. His confession is here. He was at that time a consul general of the United States in Durban. They knew where Madiba was and he was given away. Because the apartheid people could not have at that time the resources and the capacity to follow us across the world. They got the assistance of this American fellow. Bygones are bygones. We're not blaming the Americans today. But we're saying to the United States, time has come for you to recognize the justice of what we're doing here as Africans and not to poke your fingers in the eyes of our leaders and treating them like children. America needs to come back to recognize what happened here. We're Democrats. We're Democrats. We believe in social justice, in human rights, in equality. That should not be questioned. They must not judge us because we trained in the Soviet Union. I'm still classified right now as a terrorist in the United States. They must not judge us because we trained in, in Russia that we are bad people. The first country that Madiba and them went to to ask for assistance, for arms, to fight, to persecute the arms struggle after the formation of Mukondo Caesar, the first country we went to was not Russia or East Germany or Cuba or Czechoslovakia or Romania or Hungary. It was the United States of America that these men here went to ask for help. We were rejected. Now, when we went to Gaddafi, went to the Russians, the Soviets at the time, and all sorts of people who have helped us, you can't blame us for that. They thought we would be controlled. Here we are. And some of the policies, the foreign policy of the United States, must change and understand where we come from, who we are, 
not just as South Africans, my sister from the AU, but as Africans. The French understands now. The Africans are standing up themselves. Because colonialism must come to an end here. As this struggle here was largely anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist. There's a lawyer who is an advocate. His name is Ngogai Tobi. He doesn't look like a good advocate. His hair is... You know him. But the man has got brains. Tembe. He has written a book called The Land is Ours. You see, the narrative, what I'm saying here, anybody can contest. But the proof is the land upon which we are sitting. We can't be treated any other way. Continue to be disempowered, poverty slaves in our own country. By now, countries that are controlling the IMF, the World Bank, all these things, whilst they're still controlling everything that we have here. No small one that some of the children of the ANC decided to break out and form a party that wears red berets. Their credo is only one, economic freedom. They even named themselves economic freedom fighters. Now, that's little marketing they are getting from me, nothing more. I know Malema is going to say, I'm Shana. They are posting if they hear me. How oh, talk is it? They are correct. Our struggle was not merely political or political freedom. There's no justice without economic justice. That is why Ngugai Tobi Tembega says, the land is ours. That's where this thing started. Until we rectify, and land doesn't mean ground and soil. Everything under it, the air above it, this is our country. And our generosity as Africans must be understood from that context. We are here, we want to coexist with everybody. We're colored, we're Indian, we're white. We're united, I started saying that's what we are. But remember, the land is ours. And that generosity must be understood. We want to restore, in the name of the people who are here, our birthright, to restore our dignity, to restore our national self-determination in a way that our economic and political, socioeconomic justice. There can never be a road ahead. Otherwise, it's going to be rocky. You saw what happened in the country recently. When people rose, and when they do that, they don't... We never had to consult to be here. They will do that, but this time, one tongue directionless. Want to avoid that. We want leadership to understand that the principles and the virtues and the values of the people who are here must be held uppermost for us to have a good South Africa. My last word. My organization. Largely, it is the one that was here. So we can't, you know, that's the heritage. Sir Ramaphosa, Mutantli, Zuma, Tabombik, Kwete Mantash, even the young ones, Balula, Mashatil, not one of them is not talking about the ANC having to self-correct. They are all talking about the ANC having to undergo a process of renewal. Now watch that. Once you say the ANC, which was here, which played a leading role in our emancipation, needs to be renewed, you are accepting that there's something wrong with it. You are accepting that something is wrong with it. So they may all have their differences, but they agree about one thing. This thing must be renewed. It must be corrected. It must self-correct. I share that view. And maybe that is what should be bringing all of us together. However, that's not how the world moves. Other people don't have time for the ANC to be busy with its own corrections. They are moving on.
So it's a tough call for the party of these people, these stalwarts, these quality men. It's a challenge for this party to follow this tradition. The tradition of good men and women. I want to say the following as I conclude. In the name of the people who are here, I have a duty to join my comrades, male and female, in the ANC to try to renew it. And the call is made to the DA and other people. You also have to renew yourselves because the country is changing. It cannot take a party that is predominantly white and each time there's a black leader that comes in, they can't stay for long. All these parties have got to look themselves. But that's not the job of our South Africans. Those are party hacks. Your own party must look out for itself and self-correct. What is uppermost is the republic. Let's begin to speak for the republic of South Africa. For me, that comes first. Political organization second. 1912 came long after there was South Africa. The key drive is for us to hold South Africa together. The Republic comes first. Whilst we are busy rectifying things because you have done things against yourselves and so on, you have lost your moral compass and so on, the Republic comes first. That's what South Africans should do. Whilst giving us space and a chance to correct things inside our own political organizations, the heritage is not an organization. Yes, to yourselves and its members. Our heritage is the Republic of South Africa. Where it goes, we can't go far if the railways are not working and they are broken. We can't go far if the health services are broken, the clinics are down. You are going nowhere if people don't have adequate housing. Not when the schools have got no teachers, chalked down and everything. There is no road ahead of us. Then we lose the moral compass and we become not similar to the people who are here. There is no road ahead until South Africans stand together in protection and, and in fighting for your own republic. Whilst, of course, give others a chance, like me, to correct things in my own organization. But South Africans have got to stand up in the name of these leaders who are beyond political party lines. In the name of these high-quality leaders, both on the prosecution, on the defense side, as accused, it is our time to be able to mimic those people, to be like them. When I met them, I've never had such an opportunity as a very important prisoner. And I found how small I was, I had to learn from each of them. Read the book to understand what I learned when I was there. Happy Heritage Month to all of you. Thank you to the National Heritage Council for holding this, this, this gathering here. And may this heritage of our people rise and grow from year to year and from strength to strength. I thank you. Thank you very much. That was so empowering. You are so good to me. I really, really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much to Isitualandwe. Uh, uh, I knew that he wouldn't disappoint. Um, it was quite enriching, uh, the keynote address. It was multi layered. I felt strongly that there were hidden narratives. Uh, alongside the dominant narratives that we are always, uh, you know, fed out there. But he really, really, really provided a number of perspectives that we didn't know about. And for that, we are seriously and truly grateful for that. And this is a kind of memory that we would like to document, uh, preserve, and promote, and pass on to the next generation as well, because uh, history is multi-layered, as you would appreciate. It has many facets to it, and he has really, really brought out a number of facets that we need to document as the heritage institutions that are here 
we've got that responsibility to do that. Once again, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a round of applause. We, we, we are at, this, at that junct juncture now, colleagues uh, and ladies and gentlemen, where we have reconfigured our program slightly. And the way in which we're going to do this, we're going to just take two minutes reflections from our discussants. And we had hoped that we would make our discussant uh, sit by their couches there so comfortably. But now, because we want to keep each other awake uh, at this late time in the day, uh, we will be really, really requesting our discussants to come up and just reflect two minutes on the keynote address uh, by Tate Sekwale. Uh, and um, once we do that, uh, in that orderly fashion, I'm going to just give uh, our four, I'll call up our, our, our four discussant uh, one by one to come up here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we had anticipated that this was going to be more participatory and engagement and, uh, you know, open for questions. But at this juncture, at this late uh, hour in the day, we are hoping that we'll open other multi uh, uh, media platforms where you can write your inputs, interact with us on social, social media, and so on, so that we are able to uh, engage with you. At this juncture, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, call to the podium our first discussant, uh, just two minutes, <laughs> uh, Dr. Lita Misueni Ogana, uh, to come and uh, just share with us her own reflections uh, about what has been shared here by our keynote speaker. And she is a commissioner, a chairperson, uh, and a committee member of the working group of in, uh, on indigenous people uh, and populations of the African Union. And she's a chairperson and a committee member on the uh, protections of rights of people living with HIV. Welcome, madam. Uh, the state is yours. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator. I don't know how I'm going to do this in two minutes. Bear with me. Uh, our guest speaker, Honorable Tocho Sikwale, chairperson of the National Heritage Council, representatives of families of our heroes across the continent, uh, representatives of um, uh, civil society organizations, government, DDG, uh, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols observed. I bring you warm greetings from the African Union family, and particularly the Commission on African Commission on Human and People's Rights, the premier African Union organ for fighting and upholding Africans' human rights. My presence here is in this solemn ceremony is important for us as the African Union. Therefore, I am extremely delighted, humbled, and happy to represent the African Union in this very important political, politically significant, significant moment not only in the history of the Republic of South Africa, but also in the history of the African Union, whose 54 member states, with the exception of Egypt, I mean Ethiopia, was colonized and had to liberate itself from the yokes of colonialism. Today marks 60 years since the famous or infamous Rivonia trial took place here, uh, started from here, it coincides with 60 years of the African Union, which was organization of, Afri organization of African Unity, the frontline liberation struggle platform for all our countries without guns, without money, but with sheer determination and solidarity among the African nations. It also coincides with 60 years of independence of many African countries that also got freedom in 1963, including my own country, Kenya. It is therefore a day to celebrate and allow me to start by 
straight away going to the presentation we've just had. It is an overwhelming presentation by Honorable Tokyo Sikwale. And what he has taken us through, in the gender world, we call it cross-cutting. He has taken us through how he bonded with each and every prisoner that was in Robin Island, who started from Rivonia trial. And, you know, the whole notion of VIP to, today for me has changed. <laughs> if you are not a very important prisoner, I don't think you make much sense to me as a VIP. <laughs> I have learned so much. The glue, the glue that he was in Robin Island does not come from just being a prisoner. It takes sheer commitment to work with people who are 10 years, 20 years older than you and bond in a very hostile environment. So that alone teaches us a lot. I want to take a few, few lessons that we need to take from his speech. The first one is that the Rivonia trial, uh, which our former president Nelson Mandela, uh, Walter Sisulu, and the, ten, uh, the nine others and more heroes, demonstrated that it was a trial of courage, conviction, and that it had a spirit. This spirit inspired the speech we've always listened to where someone sp stands in a court, packed with oppressors, and says they are ready to die for a cause. This is a, a true calling of uh, a spirit. <laughs> the second thing I take from this uh, statement is that it is, there was serious pursuit of equality and justice, where in a court, uh, as we've just been told, uh, full of Europeans, full of all other uh, international media coming to look at these Africans who think they can make a country free without money, without guns, without education, without everything. I think it just demonstrated how Africans can dare things, how they can be resilient, how they have their own Ubuntu, which makes them dance in funerals, even when they are mourning, they know it is, take, comes from that uh, very deep thing we call value. Value of dignity and be respected for what you are. The third thing that I pick from this uh, 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 speech is the international solidarity that we have just been told that when the ANC went out looking, it is thought of the traditional friends, the Americans, the, uh, you know, they were the main, uh, the, 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 uh, the British who are the oppressing, but no, that's not where help came from. Help came from other international solidarity that today we are still struggling with. Uh, when, and, and he said it very, uh, very eloquently about this issue of Russia and China. In the African Union, we have got a building. That is the fifth building in the African Union. We have four buildings. Nobody talks about who built the other buildings. But the one which was built by China is like AU never had buildings. You know, this kind of stigmatizing your friend and I think Mandela said it very well in his first visit to America. You do not choose my friends for me. I think we should be allowed to choose our friends. And this is where international solidarity has to come from us. We have to decide whom to deal with, who is our friend out there in the globe. The other thing that this statement has said to me is about uh, the solid rock for gender equality. When you look at the photographs uh, that keep on flashing in Rivonia trial, you see Mama Winnie, she was a young, beautiful woman. You see all those wives, very young, and ready to take, escort their husbands to jail. 
This is very interesting. And it tells you that the gender equality in this country and that principle that ANC uses of gender parity does not come from nowhere. We pay tribute to Mama Winnie Mandela, to Mama Batina Susulu, Mama Andelaide Tambo, and all the other women behind them. I just saw uh, Mama Gretrud Shope holding demonstration cards outside the, you know, the, the court. And I was moved. By the way, I spent first of January with her. I'd gone to see her. She's very well. Uh, and these are the women that have inspired us. Before I became a commissioner, I was a DG for women in the African Union. So these are women that I've worked with, I have visited with, I have danced with, like we were doing yesterday when we were uh, uh, unveiling the uh, Winnie Mandela Drive and buried William Nicole. I want to say two other things about uh, what this statement talks about. It is about legacy. It is about legacy. If these people put cut deals uh, in that courtroom, and that is what is happening today, instead of getting justice, people are cutting deals, this country would not be free. They went there ready to fight to free a country, and that is a huge legacy. And I think the presenter has challenged us about wearing pointed shoes and driving very fancy cars when we are selling our own democracy, when we are not standing firm when we should. And, and I th want to say that these are things that have come out of this speech. Finally, I think the speech has talked about reconciliation and healing. Um, South Africa has gone through moments since 1994, uh, you know, the healing and the transition. But I want to tell you what my own president, founding president Kenyatta, told white people on the Kenya's Independence Day in 1963. He told them, thank you very much for this freedom. We will uh, forgive you, but we will never forget. Because when you forget, then you are burying history. Then you are likely to go back to where you started. And this is the challenge we have with our young people. Our young people must know the history. They must Google and must be taught in class. And I think this is a job that Pan-African University, the African Union University, should do. Should do take this knowledge to the classroom so that our youth know that we have a history that should never be forgotten. And so in conclusion, uh, 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 the MC, allow me to say that uh, it has been a great honor for me to come and represent the African Union in this uh, platform. Uh, uh, Honorable Sikwale informed me that AU was also formed here. This is the membership of an institution that if it did not exist, maybe would not have been free. People say, oh, the AU is a toothless uh, bulldog. Oh, AU does not do this. But a, an, an institution that can liberate 54 countries is very smart politically. It may not have money. But when it came to, you know, President Uhuru Kenyatta has to go to Hague, AU came and said no. And that is political strength. We have political strength, and it is a big threat. And our member states must know that if you want to have a strong republic, if you want to have a strong nation, we need a strong union. I thank you all very much. And now I know I have a new meaning of VIP. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for those insightful and profound uh, reflections indeed. I think there's a lot to take out of your reflections and we'll share that definitely with those even who are not here uh, so that they can actually align you know, with what was said here. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me call to the podium our next uh, discussant. I'm happy that Mayor Ogana was very concise and spot on uh, with her reflections. I'm hoping that the next discussions will do the same. I would like to, <laughs> I would like to call in that Sitole um, to come and also uh, reflect concisely as well. Three minutes uh, to do that. And that uh, Sitole is um, accused, was accused number 12 uh, of the, number four, you are being corrected. 
you know, they call me a doctor, but I must be corrected. And I welcome that because history is that which is written by people who endured the struggle. So let's welcome Tate Sitole to the podium and also let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I want to mention you uh, by your names, each one of you. I think the speakers have already done that for me. Safe to say, all protocols observed. Uh, I'm thinking of a fish. You know, the fish, to survive, it must swim. If it stops swimming, it dies. So, torture is like a fish. He's an activist. He's in politics. If he stops that, he's going to die. So I can't thank a fish for swimming. <laughs> so I don't have to thank him for, for doing what he's doing. That's his duty. Uh, that we talk of corrections, uh, just to divert a bit. Correction, correction. To me, it means the struggle is not over. We have to continue. It's continuous. Uh, it's not an event that 94 came, then that's it. So many things still has to be, have to be corrected. Um, when you know, eight in the Suzu, eight. Shia, nine, Shagalolun. That's colonial education. <laughs> because I'll tell you why. Everybody talked about colonialism and, uh, and so forth. Now, because of migrant labor system, there's what is called Fanaga law. Ne? Now, Fanaga law, when I touch a Galoten, right? Now, from Galoten, Shia Galumbili, Shia Galumbili out of 10, what do you have? You have eight. That's Panaga law. Now, Tata Galo 10 and Shia Galo Lunye. Lunye, yeah, Shia Galo Lunye. You have nine. When in fact eight in Zulu is post law. But such that the education, colonial education has dominated us, we think that is Zulu. It's Panaga law is meant to communicate with people in the minds. Yeah. Shiagalo, Shiagalo Mbili outside 10, Shiagalo Lunya outside 10, and you think you know Zulu. <laughs> so we'll correct until, till, till we, um, uh, I don't know what comes. But safe to say, all the speakers talked about colonialism. Now what colonialism does in every country when it comes, without fail, it first studies how people interact, or the glue you're speaking about, what keeps people together, that glue, because it must destroy that glue for it to dominate those people. Now, the first thing it starts with is culture, heritage of those people. Kill those things, you've killed those people, you'll dominate them until um, Jesus comes. Now, colonialism doesn't mean its ways when it does that. We think of Bantu education, you thought maybe it was just jealousy of, of, of white uh, Africa. No, it was a systematic destruction of destroying people, kill their education, because they've changed the strategy of, 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 of destroying people uh, where they don't want to use guns. They use education as a means of communication. Because communication is very, very important. They started from an early childhood level, education, the aid we were speaking about. 
teach those people aid, they won't know that uh, it's not aid, it's, it's, it's shekel, it's, it's, it's potlongo or it's kam. Until it sinks in our minds and believe that it is true what they're telling us. That's colonial dominant education uh, um, pitted amongst our people. Once they kill that thing, they bring in their own education. And you'll think that because they, they like us, they are able to... It's just that Africans were not able to hide it. We call it Bantu education. Seriously, Bantu education. Kill the culture. Because that's the clue that keeps us together. So I must say, when, he, when Toki invited me, I said, okay, I'll come. In fact, he was commanding me. And I said, I'll come. Heritage, I'll come. Because that's very, very important. Many people have forgotten about our heritage. Now, and it's not possible to forget. Because once you've got the gray matter here, that gray matter, there's a portion there where that deals with memory. You'll see when you leave this place, you want to go to your, where you come from, your home. Um, if you come from uh, Soweto or wherever, you won't go to Pretoria and say, I'm going home. You'll be lost. It means you, there's something wrong with the memory here. Because you must drive straight to Soweto, the, where you come from. That's the responsibility of this gray matter, that portion of the gray matter uh, that makes you not to forget. It's called memory. Heritage, when you, you, you publicize it, is part of conscientizing people about their memory. Pricking it so that, because the, the other forces are trying to make that portion forget, for, portion of the brain to forget. But I know it's difficult to make it forget. They'll try to come up with all sorts of education, material themes, and what have you, until you believe that what they're doing is true, um, you can't change it, but we can. So heritage as a means of communication, as a means of educating, is very key, very key. There are people who are not going to like it because they must always oppose it. You can't run alone and think that there will be an opposite force against the process of what you call, this is what I call a renewal. So you have to come about with a number of uh, outreach programs. It's just not outreach programs. It's a process of educating people or pricking their memory to remember where they come from and what they are capable of doing. And indeed, they can do that. So. Um, I'm also not going to praise you, it's your job. I can't praise the fish for, for, for swimming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you for, for, for the profound uh, reflections. Um, that is totally, you really, really hit the nail on the head that we need to self-correct, even ourselves. Uh, let's not shy away from being authentically African and indigenous in our approach. Um, and the kind of heritage that we really want to bequeath to the next generation should indeed carry the authenticity that we desire. Thank you very much for that. Our next discussant, ladies and gentlemen, let me call to the podium uh, Prof. Nkondo. Uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction. He's a cultural activist, he's a scholar, he's an author. He is, you know, uh, I know that he is also attached to the OR Tamb of leader, a School of Leadership. Uh, he's been quite instrumental in the sector. And uh, would you maybe let's sit down. No, 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 no. Are, you, are you okay? I'm okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Let's give him a round of applause. Well, 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 thanks very much, uh, uh, Program Director. For, I really want to start off by uh, Thanking our senior senior comrade uh, Hokio for for you know there's something about the individual and history. Here we are we are not listening to narrative. We are not listening to patterns of change in history. 
were listening to a person enacting his own life. For young scholars coming up, when you trace the history of this country, don't confine yourself to patterns. Don't confine yourself to ideology. Please concern, confine yourself to the internal dynamics of extraordinary people like Tokyo. Very, very important. We won't have time, Chair, to explain why this is important if we want to teach our children and our students how to recall the past and how to make it dramatic and concrete. I have only three comments, Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo, I'm using Tokyo as a, as a, as a brand, affectionate name. <laughs> Why you're called Tokyo, you're not in a hurry to divide to us. But anyway, that's OK. <laughs> I think one of the three things, colleagues, comrades, that came out today from Tokyo's rendition and the comments from my two colleagues. What is significant about Billisfield? What is significant about Robben Island? What is significant about the Kronstadt prison for women? What is significant about Albert Lutulis Museum? is that there's a major shift in our thinking about each other in the world, shifting from oppositional to complementary differences. Being white, being black, being male, being female, the oppositions are not foundational. The oppositions are not primary. They are contingent and historical. We constructed them so they can be turned into complementary differences in terms of which, in all our differences, we begin to recognize each other in each other. I think that the brilliant wisdom, Tokyo, that, uh, that leaders will teach us, what your own life teaches. The, 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 what do we do with this? As we're drawing up the strategy with the NHC and the Department of Sport, as we're drawing up the framework for nominating these sites, we, we, we had to say exactly what is the value of this project. And we came out with an important answer, that these national sites should be used as instruments for social cohesion and regional integrity. If you look at the, at the NDP, there are about 10 outcomes there. One of the outcomes there is social cohesion. The other one is regional integration. The most strategic place to do that is through the work of the NEC and the Trust Program. It's important for us to acknowledge that this is a way in which we can dramatize the possibilities of working together in spite of our differences. It's a movement from apartheid thinking, a, a movement from colonial thinking, a movement into Ubuntu, into complementary differences, into equivalences. And that's where the renewal of the ANC must focus on, ultimately. But why name this place? Why be preoccupied with naming this place? Why name Robben Island? Why name Albert Lutulis Museum? Why name, why name, why name? The naming of these sites is more than words. The naming of this site is, is a command, as it were, to move from here to there. So the naming of sites is a profound political project 
that the government is using to mobilize memory about where we come from and where we should go is a very important, and we should again commend the NHC and his department for doing this. It's a very, very important thing. Uh, you know, the road to freedom, the road to independence, it had to be there because of the trans-territorial nature of the struggle. This thing you call South Africa or, or Namibia or Uganda, these came, you know, these are colonial impositions, colonial you know, no barriers on the infinite space we call Africa. So the trans-territorial nature of this project is an instrument for pan-Africanism. And I think it's important that we have today uh, our colleague from, from the AU to dramatize the trans-territorial nature of this place and of this. Lilisfield, Rivonia is is a place, it's an event, and as an event, it has consequences and causes. It's important that we, we, we make sure that our children come to comprehend the causes of this event and its consequences. It's extreme. Now, where do we go for that? Usually, we use the school we use the classroom to educate. But I'm telling you that the classroom alone is inadequate. This is too big for education alone. We must make use of the family, the, the laps of parents, where consciousness begins. We must make sure that the family becomes an official you know, agent of change and not just private space. I want to suggest that we move on deeper than the community. The family must be, must be co-opted to help us change this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, project. It's extremely important for us so far, and we discussed this when we're drawing up the agenda for this program, that so far these sites have carried mainly symbolic value, the symbolism of little, the symbolism of Rivonia. But it's about time we found. Let us move, let us connect symbolism with the material values of these sites. How do ordinary people around here benefit from this memory? How do people around any side of the country? So the utility value of sites is as important as a symbolic pearl. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you for, for the insight. And, um, you know, we've got our own uh, living human treasures uh, with wealth of wisdom and intellect. You know, there's a new term and a new word that I've learned here, complementary differences. You know, that is my takeaway here. And uh, we know when we have such, uh, let's give him a round of applause <laughs> for the insights and really, really digesting and dissecting and unpacking really the salient points so succinctly and, and, and concise the way in which he has done. And uh, we are truly grateful to have people like uh, Professor Nkonda amongst our midst who are very serious about the business of preserving our heritage and passing it on to the next generation. Um, amongst our discussant, last, uh, amongst our discussant, we've got our own um, head of strategy at the Heritage Council, uh, Ms. Palisa Kadi. She's wearing so many hats. She's also a board member of the SABC. She's also the chairperson of the South African. Sorry, 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 sorry about that. Um, colleagues, uh, let's assist there, please. Please, yeah, let's do something about that monitor. Thank you. Let's call to the podium, oh, Ms. Kadi, uh, to reflect on the speech. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Manetsi, um, colleagues, and good afternoon to all the members. We are also sorry about the um, tragedy that almost um, happened there. I don't know how to uh, align to it. When you mentioned SAPC and TV, it fell. <laughs> uh, and, and that is not a good um, uh, <laughs> alignment um, for me with the challenges that we all know, hoping that all people here are paying TV licenses and um, so that we continue engaging in this content in many other platforms. My name is Bali Zagadi. Uh, and that is why I wondered when I was appointed as the chairperson of the South African Geographical Names Council, um, that what kind of a nation entrusts young people uh, to take care of this task, which is transformative, but very provoking. And I thought about ages. Um, uh, Dr. Manetsi was my, my classmate uh, at the Robben Island uh, Heritage Program years back when this nation had an investment in knowing that this heritage will need to live on such that it is infused, it is institutionalized in our um, knowledge systems, but also in our educational um, uh, institutions. I came from the University of the Western Cape at the time and appreciated my first ride, which was not a joyful ride to the island. And this is how I relate with this site and the Robben Island I went to. Having also had a conversation with Ndade uh, Mutsualedi, who is an exact age with my father, the, the son who is here with us, um, I told him that when I landed in Robben Island, I would have thought as a young person it was going to give me a good spirit of triumph, uh, triumph you know, and jubilation. But that was when I realized that this is a place of resilience, a place of souls that were broken. Because walking to the quarry, being part of the cells, uh, unfortunately, I also went during winter time there. And one could wonder, especially in that discipline when your soap did not uh, work and, you, and it only had to take a shampoo to have a proper body bath, meaning that there was something very systematic about the intent of removing people. So I asked a lot of questions as a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, trying to understand the special place, but also the historical place that many people, even from where I come from, Port Elizabeth, former, Otadu Yina, how did these people survive here? And when we started then recording the histories and working um, under Mr. Mpumluana, who's now running our World Heritage um, Program at NHC, at the education section, I, one looked at the relevance of the work we were doing. And it was not glorified work, but the connection that it took from a young person working under supervision, of course, because this required elements of debriefing. This was not enough for anyone to take a life story, because it is a life story to stay uh, in one place for so long. And it took one quite a lot of reflection and consciousness in knowing that every decision as a young person that I make on behalf of other South Africans, I should be held responsible when they are inorderly, but also unethical in many forms. So one continues to carry that prism, one continues to carry those reminders because of the early exposure to the trialists who were there, but also all those who came after them. But also I continued to wonder the resilience, resilience patterns 
of taking Susan Kruger, the boat. We just shared moments that they were lady. That was a horrible uh, boat. <laughs> <laughs>